of all time. And the original Superman, whose name, curiously enough, was not George Reeves. Uh, have good talk about what it was like to make the old shoot 'em up westerns for Republic Studios out here in Southern California. The serials that all of us enjoyed at the Saturday afternoon matinees. We have got films, pictures, and best of all, we have the heroes themselves. Mr. Roy Rogers, Tim McCoy, Kirk Allen, and Monty Hale. And the man who is bringing all the past to the present, Mr. Snuff Garrett, who has the rights to all of these features and pictures. And is putting them all together so that all of us can enjoy them once again. And as I say, we've got some film clips during the show this morning that will bring back those days when all of us could pay uh, 10 or 12 cents and spend three or four hours at the picture show on Saturday afternoon. Tomorrow night here we have a rare visit with a rare person, Mr. Henry Miller. Here is a man who wrote such books as The Tropic of Cancer and The Tropic of Capricorn. They were banned from bookstores in the United States for 30 years because they were thought to be obscene. 30 years ago they were called dirty books. Now they are called classics, which is what they were then, except some people didn't think so. Wednesday, Jory Graham, who was a cancer victim, Mr. Graham writes a bi-monthly column for the Chicago Daily News on how to cope with cancer. And then on Thursday, live from Burbank here, we have Mr. Hugh Downs, one-time newscaster, announcer, interviewer, narrator, sidekick for Jack Parr on the old Tonight Show from New York, the former host of the Today Show. He now has a new talk program on PBS, which I suppose is where all of us will eventually wind up who do talk to Cabot's over there now, and now Hugh Downs has a show on PBS. He will be here on Thursday night. You're not going to hear a great deal from me tonight because I spent today, a part of today, at the dentist. And I'm not going to bore you with it, but you all know what happens when you go there. It doesn't hurt when you're in the chair. But when you leave after the Novocaine, I stop and had a cup of coffee. It starts coming out your throat. And people look at you strange in restaurants when coffee is drooling onto your shirt. You know what I mean? So I heard a little bit tonight, and I'll shut up and let the guests talk. Uh, and then you can all take back your awards that say that I, I interrupt people more than anybody else. We'll be right back with, uh, with all the people I mentioned, Roy Rogers, Tim McCoy, Kirk Allen, Monty Hale. Movies, uh, still pictures, maybe a horse will come in here. Who knows? <laughs> we'll be right back after these announcements. Now, I'm going to read the cards and introduce all the guests, but you know them all anyway. But I want to do this so that the people don't remember. This will help them recall. Mr. Roy Rogers is possibly, and I'm going to get in trouble with three guys here for saying this, <laughs> possibly the best-known cowboy in the world. He is the king of the cowboys who played in 87 films, 189 if you count the TV movies that he made, with his loyal wife, Dale, and his trusty horse, horse Trigger. Roy came in here for some parades and mining his Roy Rogers Museum to reminisce about the long career of this man who always wore the white hat. Colonel Tim McCoy got the jump on Roy Rogers by a couple of years. He is now 86 years of age. So he was packing them into movie houses in the 30s and 40s. He was a good guy, and as he is wearing tonight, he wore a black hat. He'll explain that and tell how his real cowboy trail led to fame and fun in yesterday's Hollywood. He has a new autobiography out, which is called Tim McCoy Remembers the West. Kirk Allen was the first Superman. He was an Eastern dancer who leaped overnight into a Western saddle as a cowboy actor. He'll tell us how he then switched from riding the range to leaping over tall buildings in a single bound as the wondrous superperson. And Mr. Monty Hale, whose first picture was Home on the Range, he also featured, that picture also featured an eight-year-old boy who was named Robert Blake and still is. He'll tell us about playing a long string of two-fisted Western defenders of justice in many Republic pictures and also appearing with James Dean in the epic Western based on Edna Ferber's novel, which was called Giant. End <laughs> of All right. Say, listen, I want to, let me just ask Roy, it was windy in the parade last night. Big winds here. Oh, it was a beautiful. I thought it was a backup on the desert. <laughs> really? Really? It really blew, uh, well, especially when you'd make a cross street, you know, they mm -hmm. were blowing, blowing from the north. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some thumbtacks in my hat to hold it on because it was really blowing. Did, did you fellas all work together? You have to excuse my ignorance, but where did you where did you cross paths uh, or cross trails? Well, Monty and I worked at the same studio. We made our series yeah. of pictures at Republic Pictures. Uh-huh. That's right. I you know what? When I first came out of here, Tom, I was scared to death. Who was but right now? I'm just a little nervous. Well, I don't know why. I'm the most nervous of all because you you fellows all know know what we're going to talk about, and I don't know as much about it as you guys do. You well, know? I'll tell you, Tom. Sitting next to this man here makes me nervous. Well, <laughs> so this is the first time I've crossed trails with Colonel Tim. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, first time we met. You yes. you are in fact a colonel. You were the adjutant general of the state. Were you? Yeah, I was a brigadier general then. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I've been I've been. Uh, I remember when I came back on duty for World War II, one of the questions was asked. <laughs> I was still a lieutenant colonel. That was my permanent rank. Mm -hmm. And I got my eagles when I came back. And uh, there were three lieutenant colonels there. And they wanted to find out some seniority. 
one fellow said, well, I, I was just promoted to a lieutenant colonel before I came here. Somebody else said, well, I've only been a lieutenant for six months. Well, I said, you're talking to the ranking lieutenant colonel of the world. I've been <laughs> lieutenant colonel since World War One. Hey, 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 at the age of 86, you are not only the ranking lieutenant colonel, you are possibly the only one left that, uh, you know, who can pull rank on you? Probably. You know, it's a very funny thing about that, and I know Royal appreciates the money here. The, uh, when I was out here on that uh, $64,000 New York, rather, $64,000 challenge. Mm -hmm. Someone said, did they give you any answers? I said, the hell, they never asked me any questions. <laughs> I got a telegram a couple of days later from a fellow who was lieutenant in a cavalry regiment with me at, at uh, Fort Riley years before. He said, he's a lawyer in Washington. He said, you know, it did my heart good to see an old horse cavalryman walk out on that stage last night. Hell, I thought you died with custard. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go around the, 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 the room here and ask you all how you got from wherever you were born to California. Now, I mentioned that you were an actor in New York on the boards, and all of a sudden you picked up and came west. What was the reason for Well, that? I was in New York, uh, as you call it, on the boards, <laughs> and in vaudeville, and in nightclubs, and uh, with people like Olson and Johnson and vaudeville and all that. I. Was that Hell's a Poppin'? Yeah, run? sure. Before it got to Broadway, a couple, several years before it got to Broadway, they toured. Of course, they were, they were great showmen. Uh, when I came to California, I had already been in the business about 12, 13 years. And I have about 12 Broadway shows to my credit, aside from the other things that I did. And when I came to California, it wasn't to get into pictures. I came out here uh, for a rest because I was doing nightclubs and radio back there and everything, and I was losing weight and getting thin, and I thought, well, nuts, uh, you know, I'm not going to live forever. I'm going to go to California for a rest. So I came out here, and I lived with Fred Skelton for about a year. You're kidding. Yeah, he was a good pal of mine from the old Waterville days and back, <laughs> back in the days when we were knocking around. And uh, uh, he was on a picture at MGM then uh, called Lady Be Good. And he brought a little girl home from the picture one night, and I liked her a little bit. And so eventually we got married, and she couldn't go back east because she was in, under contract. So I stayed out here, and I said, well, I think I'll just make the best of it in pictures, see what I can do in pictures. And uh, when I got an agent, the very first place he took me was to Republic for an interview. And they, we talked and talked, and I told them all the things that I did, and they were very impressed being leading man here and doing this and doing everything. He says, well, Kirk, if something comes up, uh, we'll, call you. we'll give you a call. No, don't call see, us. You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Leave your name and address with the girl at the door. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I was home that night about 8 o'clock. I got a telephone call. I said, Kirk, are you a quick study? And I said, well, you know, coming from New York, doing stock, you know, it's well, pretty quick. I said, if it's not more than 50 sides, I can learn it by tomorrow. He said, oh, no, 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 we mean four or five sides. I said, well, hell, I can win. Four or five what? Four or five sides. What, what? Uh, pages. Oh, okay. All right. Four or five <laughs> pages of dialogue. You call them sides. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, no. I said, well, I said, well sure. I, uh, he says, well, now, the fellow that was supposed to go out with Bill Elliott, uh, no offense there. That's all right. <laughs> Love Bill. <laughs> oh, he's a very fine fellow, he was. So he, uh, he says, the fellow was supposed to go out with Bill Elliott tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. It's just your size. And I, I believe you could even fit his clothes. He says, gee, you'll be great. Kirk, he says, it'll be a great favor to us. Uh, w would you do it? And I said, oh, you bet I will. So that was my very first picture in Hollywood uh, with Bill Elliott. And I thought it was a... Oh, I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world, working an action picture. And I think I stayed on a lot for, uh, oh, I must have made about 12 or more pictures before I even got off the lot to go somewhere else to look for a job, mm -hmm. you know? So that was your I honor. I was in one picture with, uh, with Roy, and I can never remember the name of it. It had <coughs> something to do with, uh, gosh, I can't remember even a word from the title. <laughs> I don't, because they kept putting me from one picture into another. They all you know? sounded alike, Kurt. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. It wasn't a great variety. It was the no, long right. trail, the happy <laughs> trail, the sad <laughs> trail, the winding trail. <laughs> gun sight pass. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you came out here, you drove a truck for a time. Well, you see, he came out, he was skinny from uh, working too hard. Mm -hmm. I came out, I was skinny too, but it wasn't from working, it was from not working. <laughs> it was from eating too little. <laughs> I worked in a shoe factory in Cincinnati just before I came out. And, uh, of course, it's 1930, you're right at the bottom of the Depression, and you couldn't buy a job in those days. What did you do in the shoe factory? I worked in the insole department. I worked about seven or eight jobs. Oh, the poor and, um, did you I, hate it? <laughs> 
No, I enjoyed it. it a, I was working. It was a job. It was a job. It certainly was. And uh, I came to California to visit my older sister, and I got a job driving the sand and gravel truck. And um, the guy that had the trucks lost them during the Depression. And I went up north, and I picked peaches with the Okies and the migrant workers. <laughs> And uh, I found out later that John Steinbeck wrote the Grapes of Wrath at the same time we were there. And I came back and I couldn't get a job and I went on a little radio station out in Inglewood. I always uh, could play the guitar and my mom and dad played mandolin guitar and my three sisters and I all learned to play because we lived in the country and we lived way back in the hills and, and that we made our manufactured our own entertainment. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, got on this little radio station, I sang and yodeled and did I uh, played the mandolin and the guitar, and he took my name and address, and about uh, three days later, a guy got, got in touch with me, and I joined a group called the Rocky Mountaineers, and that was a starting. Uh, over the next three years, I organized the Sons of the Pioneers. In 1937, uh, Republic Pictures was looking for another cowboy, and uh, so I saddled my guitar and went out there, <laughs> and uh, they, liked, they liked me, and I signed up there, and I was there 14 years. Okay, Monty, where, where, where did you come from? Well, I come from Houston out here, Tom. Um, I used to drive a Manx, uh, Brinks money wagon down in Houston, uh, carrying the Well, you still do, but now it's your own. So you make a little bit, but I worked on... Uh, are those uh, real gold coins? Yes, yeah, sir. These are $20 gold pieces here. There's a $10 gold piece here. Off with ready. Well, why don't you throw that one away? This is a collector's <laughs> item here. This is a Roman numeral date on this one. It's a real collector's item. It's 1907 Roman numeral, mm -hmm. St. Gordon. They this certainly are pretty. Here's one Len Anderson gave me. It's a ring. It's a five dollar gold piece. Uh, Indian head, 1913. But I was working in Houston in vaudeville, like Kirk. I was in vaudeville playing a guitar. I knew about four holes on a guitar. And here come a bunch of stars from Hollywood down there to sell war bonds. And I met uh, Hunts Hall of the Dead End Kids mm -hmm. and Johnny Mac Brown, Jimmy Wakeley, just a big bunch of stars down there. And they needed a guitar player to accompany one of the stars on the tour. So I happened to know a couple of holes on the guitar to go with them. I went with them for two weeks, and we sold about $60 million worth of bonds. Mm -hmm. And Phil Isley, who is Jennifer Jones' father, sent a telegram to Mr. Yates at Own Republic Studios and told him he'd like to get me a screen test. So I came out and made a little screen test, and I was there about six years. Mm -hmm. And how about, uh, how about Tim here? What brought you to the West? Well, you know, I don't like to be facetious, but if someone said, how did you happen to come into pictures? I said, I rode in on the back of an Indian. <laughs> practically, that's the best way I came to Hollywood because uh, my association in Wyoming had been with the Indians mostly. And when I was Adjutant General, of course, it gave me a chance to get around. And I had been around those Indians and had a lot of influence over You them. hired uh, or coordinated the appearance of Indians in an old, old picture, did you not? And then you came out here and did, uh, did a, 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 pre a, a prologue at Drama Theater. Well, that was the covered wagon. They... Uh, they wanted to make this picture, and Jesse Lasky wanted that to be authentic. He didn't want a bunch of uh, Mexicans and Filipinos with wigs on. He wanted the real article. So they contacted me. I suppose some articles would appear when I was with General Scott, among those Indians so much. And uh, they said, this fellow may be the chap we're looking for. Because they'd send someone out from the studio and say, go up and get Indians. He said, yeah. The guy from the studio said he'd never seen an Indian. So he'd come up on a reservation and see these old long hairs, and he'd say, how would you like to go out to Hollywood and make a picture? We're going to pay you so much a day. You'll get beef. You'll get so-and-so. And he says, ah, ah, this is pretty good. You know, mm -hmm. that's all right. He overlooked the fact that they, there was an agent on the reservation, and he'd gone over the heads of all these Indian agents. So when he came out to get his Indians, he didn't have any Indians. No. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, I'm trying to make farmers of these fellows, mm -hmm. white men out of them, not playing wild savage. Mm -hmm. So then they got in touch with me and said, would you be interested in doing this? Well, you know what the lure of moving pictures was. Emerson Huff had just written The Covered Wagon, which I had read. I was crazy about the idea. I said, sure. So I came on out and chatted with them. They uh, told me what they wanted. And I said, fine. So I headed back up into the northwest up there, Wind River and Fort Hall, rounded up two solid train loads of Indians, TP squaws, papooses, dogs, everything to make an <laughs> Indian the, the, the totem poles, the works, uh, everything. No, no, they don't have them over there. Oh, okay. Plains Indians is what we had. <coughs> so after we finished the picture, because I had four different tribes speaking four different languages, 
So I'd give them direction by this Indian Sign Language, which is universal among all the Plains Indians, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Jesse Lasky sent for me one morning, and he said, what is this thing that I see all these actors trying to do with their hands? Mm -hmm. Oh, I said, they're, they're trying to talk signs. So he said, well, what's it all about? We spent the whole morning in there. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, I think the public would be very interested in seeing that, something new. Could you bring down a bunch of Indians and uh, work out a prologue ahead of the picture at Gromans Theater? It was the Egyptian then, long before the uh, Chinese were mm -hmm. built. And I said, well, I think I could. He said, well, would it bother you to come out on the stage and uh, talk to the audience a bit? Well, I said, I don't think so. So I went up and rounded up about 50 Indians and brought them down to Gromans, and we camped them first right over in Coenga Pass. Mm -hmm. Had this Indian village, all their teepees. The next bunch I brought down, we camped them on Hollywood Boulevard where the Egyptian theater is now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, stay, okay. I stayed there for with those Indians. I'd come out and this, do this prologue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed there for about eight months. And then they asked me to take the covered wagon to London. So I said, fine. So I got a new bunch of Indians. And they took a fellow who's an actor so it was and, a long uh, trip from Wyoming to Hollywood, uh, wasn't it? Quite a way. <laughs> In those days. And that's how I have to... Uh, so I, uh, by the time I came back from Europe, I'd had so much publicity that MGM thought I might be a type for a Western star. Mm -hmm. So they starred me in my very first picture. <laughs> and I was MGM, and I was the only Western star they ever had, you see. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's how I came into the business through the Indian. <laughs> now, you said a key word, authenticity, which is yeah. how, well, I want to ask you all about how authentic were the Westerns, but I have to pause for these words from our affiliated stations. We'll be right back. How bad do you want us to lie? <laughs> much of the real West did we see in the films that all you guys made? <laughs> well, I think a lot of it depends on the writers. Uh, I think a lot of them dug back into history and uh, they were uh, pretty authentic. Uh, I know I made some about Jesse James and of course they dug up all the history they could on Jesse James and, and also Billy the Kid. And I think uh, some of the period pictures were more authentic. And then later on, as uh, after Oklahoma became such a, such a success as a musical western in, in New York, they uh, started making musicals. And that's when they changed my style of pictures to uh, the musical westerns and put music in them. I mean, did cowboys ride around singing, get along, little doggy, get along, little I think so. Or... They, around the campfires at night, I think uh, there was always somebody there with some yeah. kind of an instrument. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's like uh, I was raised on a farm where um, we entertained ourselves, you know, uh, with instruments. And uh, uh, I think it probably, I never lived on a ranch in those days, but uh, I'm sure it was the same way out there for their own entertainment. Can you, here, here's a question I've always wanted to know. How can a guy be riding along on a horse, shooting at the bad guys with one hand, and rolling a cigarette perfectly in the other hand and putting it in his mouth? I'd see these guys in the pictures when I was a kid, you know, you're fooling around with tobacco. So we all go out and buy the Bull Durham and the papers, right? You'd sit there for a week trying to roll a cigarette, then I'd go and watch some western of some guy, bang, bang, and he's pissing his mouth, lucky strike, perfect. How do you do that? I'm going to tell you something. It ain't easy. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now, Tom. It's a lot of fun. I'll tell you one thing. It's great. I'll have to watch this man roll his eyes in those old westerns. I mean, he could roll his eyes better than any man I ever looked at. Like that. I mean, he laid it on him. That got to be a trademark after a while. It's you know? beautiful, Colonel. But I did it by accident, you know. My eyes were blue, and they used to, when I was at MGM, they'd hold up a piece of... These boys know what it's up against. They try to do all the things they can to make life miserable for you. And doing it in a close-up, they'd come up with a, with a big uh, plaque that had black velvet on it, supposed to reflect the darkness from the black velvet into my eyes. Mm -hmm. And if I happen to look this way, playing a scene normally, they say, oh, don't, don't turn your eyes so much. You show too much of the white of them. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my eye. You say, forget it. Go away. Yeah. And the first thing I said, oh, Look at that steely look he gets. <laughs> so they forgot all about the black belt. <laughs> I never had to worry about that. I never had any eyes. <laughs> I smile, they go shit. <laughs> so uh, uh, my first picture, when I, uh, they were worried about it, the studio, about my eyes being small and squinty. And um, so they sent a doctor out on location, and ever so often he'd put drops in my eyes and paralyze them for a while. <laughs> and uh, after the first picture was out, and they liked what they saw, <clears throat> 
the doctor didn't go out anymore, but uh, <laughs> uh, I never will forget this being the numb-eyed for about the whole first picture. And uh, it turned out I started getting more letters on that, and I did it. I sort of looked more like an outdoorsman than, than most of the cowboys up to that time. Mm -hmm. Roy, you remember when uh, Harry Carey used to do this? Oh, that. I knew oh, something was about oh, to happen when oh, he did that. You remember when yeah, he used to do that? This is a bit of business. Have you ever seen these westerns where the, the cowboy comes riding right into the town like this looking? <laughs> He's looking like that, and there's an old boy with a thin mustache like that over there. Punches his partner and says, I think that's him. And he, he pulls up and ties up, and he goes in and whips all this guy's friends. Oh, and the main crook comes up and says, I can use a man like you. <laughs> I always wanted to make a western where the guy lived in the town. I think I was the first guy to do that. he already lived there. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I don't want to hog it all, Kirk. No, that's all right. I'm interested because, you know, you're going to gang like this together and everybody like hammered up you know well, that's good that's good I'm, i worked I'm with roy i yeah. worked with roy in a thing called trailer robin hood and we had more fun on that yeah, i think we're getting christmas trees down they had a, several of the cowboys in it snuffy i'm gonna buy that prince most snuffy one of these days <laughs> well, well, I'll get is this money. the one where he uh does to get the christmas trees yes i got it now wait i got the i got the clip right here let me clip? i think i've got let me get the clip out uh-huh uh this will spotlight roy rogers from the trail of robin hood 1950 shows roy fighting with some bad guys who have set the Red River Bridge on fire so the good guys can't get across the bridge with a wagon train of Christmas That's trees. exactly what it is. Give it a roll. Here it comes. <laughs> important to get uh, the Christmas trees across yeah. that bridge. Well, you have to see the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Not tonight, Joseph. We did really Not build tonight. up those. <laughs> Where uh, uh, Jack Holt was in the picture. It was one of the last pictures that Jack made. And uh, he was uh, raising Christmas trees, and uh, there was a bunch of heavies coming there, and they were rustling the Christmas trees. Have you ever heard of a Christmas tree being rustled? <laughs> and it happens all the time. But anyway, <laughs> he, he, uh, many headlines, you know. he was raising them for a, a, a group of uh, kids that couldn't afford Christmas trees. And he'd, uh, these guys, he caught them cutting his Christmas trees he's raising for the kids. Mm -hmm. So we all joined together and helped him save for all these Christmas trees were cut and loaded in these other guys' wagons. And uh, they tried to burn the bridge to keep us from getting them to I, town. That's so what, they could that's get more what for, I got. Well, they could get more for their Christmas trees if our bunch didn't get in there. Now, Monty, you must have had a small part I didn't see in the picture at all. They well, just came in at the end to help me get... We just uh, help him drive the trees. Oh, I got you. I, Roy, Roy, when he can't think of the name of this movie, he calls it the one with a burning bridge. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Good movie, Roy. Back to authenticity for a second. Uh, the pictures that you fellas made really didn't portray Indians the way Indians were or are. Fair, is that, that that's true, is it? Uh, I never did. Uh, very few Indian pictures. Well, uh, a Western pictures. Western, you yeah. know, where the Indians were always the bad people and all. Well, my uh, my Westerns were all contemporary. They're more or less up to up to time. I went back. Mm -hmm. I did several uh, when I first went to Republic uh, that were period pictures, which went back in the 1800s, which were more authentic than the than the later ones. You know, they were contemporary Westerns of some modern times. We drove automobiles and uh, such as that. Well, let's uh, ask the Indian expert. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think probably that uh, I made probably the first really authentic Indian picture with real Indians that had been made, you know. That was war paint. That was MGM. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went right back up on the Wind River Reservation among the Shoshones and the Arapahoes to do this. And strangely enough, those were, those were silent pictures. And the funny part of it is because I would give, I'd talk to all these Indians when I was talking to them, uh, I'd be using signs, which they do, even though they speak their language, they'll still talk signs. And uh, I'd talk signs to these Indians, and when we got down into Oklahoma, these old Indians would come into the theater and spend all day in there because they knew what was going on up there. They could read my signs. And, uh, so <laughs> the signs don't real... make very much sound, do they? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing I was asking you was, you know, in the Westerns I saw as a boy, the Indians were always the enemy. Oh, yes, definitely had to be. So you mm -hmm. had to turn, I had a hard time uh, turning them around to say, look here, uh, these fellows had something on their side too because the white man was pushing them back and every time the Indian resisted, why well, they took more land away from them and gave them a little smaller piece, you know? I think that's where it came from uh, yeah. back in those early days when uh, we were winning, going west and taking over territory mm -hmm. after territory and the winning of the West is actually the only early history we have mm -hmm. and our uh, competition with the Indians because it was their land and for the West we got we got into the Mexican end of it too and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, basically how it started. I made one movie that uh, had a station wagon in it <laughs> and then I had one line that said shoot low they might be crawling. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that one. I'm going to find out how Kirk Allen got from Republic to, to Superman after these words from our sponsors. I hope all of you will stay tuned. So. to being a Republic Western star, uh, Kirk Allen was the original Superman in the movies and in the and in the serials, the little 20-minute vignettes that showed on Saturday afternoon. That's How right. did you make that transition? Oh, that transition. Now, uh, see, after I left Republic, I was... Is that you there? That's me. Uh-huh, that's me. That's the way I looked. You see, after I left Republic, I went to Columbia, and I made uh, a picture called My Sister Eileen with... Uh, Ross Russell and Janet Blair, mm -hmm. and I, play, I I did a part in there where I spoke all Portuguese, you see. Now, the girls didn't understand me, and I didn't understand their English, and it made the scene very funny, see, because they tried to get us out of the house, so we formed the conga line. She says, Guapo. Oh, right, right, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, now uh, I see uh, the scene. Yeah. They come in the back door, see, but, uh, but we didn't leave. We came back in with her, you see. It was quite a, quite a nice picture. Then I did another picture. This was by way of making a test. They said, test costs too much money. Put him in a picture. Let's see what he, uh, what he looks like. He said, we know we can act, but let's see what he looks like in a picture, see. <laughs> so then I went into another picture called You Were Never Lowly with Rita Hayworth. And uh, following that, I did another picture called uh, Is Everybody Happy? And follow I didn't mind making these kind of tests because they had to pay me for all of this. <laughs> so then, uh, so they, then they did want to sign me. And of course, my my uh, agent had grandiose ideas, and he said, "No, he said, I've got something else planned for you." So uh, I didn't do that. I must have made about 40, 40 or forty-five pictures, maybe, uh, before they asked. I made eight for the same producer who made Superman, and uh, uh, this is why. He called me, I think, but you know, when I went to, when I went for the audition, I thought, uh, I thought, well, it's another picture that the guys from New York want to see what I look like to see if I look like the comic strip. So I went in there and I, you know, tried to look like the comic strip, except I had a beard 
and uh, that made the producer mad. So he went, ran down, got some stills, brought them up, and looked. He said, "Now take your shirt off, Kirk." I said, "Oh, fine." So I took my shirt off, and he says, "You see down there, that fellow's in good shape, see?" And I was pretty good shape because I lifted barbells and all that. I was still very young. So, <laughs> so then he said to me, "Now take off your pants." Hey, wait a minute. What kind of old are you? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> they wanted to see if you were the real <laughs> Superman. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew we'd catch up with you. Uh, said, no, 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 no,
and his horse stopped and he looked down and it seemed like about a half a mile there was a lake he turned his horse around and took a leaping jump seeing as the horse started to go down it says continued next week <laughs> <laughs> i said i gotta go back to see what was one of yours give an example of one of yours oh one of mine I, yeah i can't remember the endings of them. you know when you make when you make cereals they make them like you do feature pictures they break them down everything you do is here here you do here and everything you do in the office you do in the office and everything you do out there you do there see you, this is a quick way it's of making saving it. saving money <clears throat> they save money they make it because it's one story you see and i never know whether there's an ending of, of one of those and where there isn't and i never saw one of my serials i never even saw the rushes why not because you see i played two parts in it i, I was i was superman and i was clark kent well, as Clark Kent, I could look silly, you know, and I could yeah. be the mild-mannered reporter who knows nothing, you know. He's, he's fumbling his way through everything, you know. But as Superman, I had to be firm. And when I uh, got out there to do something, I really had to do it with... And some of them are pretty ridiculous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are pretty ridiculous. But I break myself up in the middle of them because we had talk over rehearsals. You know, you do everything with props. So you have a lot of props to work with. And you break this and you break that and you tear this apart. I rip the safe off, the big, big doors, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I rip that off of there and get the girl out of there and fly off with the girl and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I, thought, and I have to do it seriously because the kids, you know, you, you can't laugh at yourself. You can't, you can't do it kidding. So the kids have to believe it. And then when you get to clock in, so I thought, if I went in and looked at the Russians, and when I, I thought... Yeah, if, I see, if I see myself looking that ridiculous, it's going to affect my performance. <laughs> so I said, forget it. Now, I said to the producer, I said, you go look at him. If you're still smiling when you come out, I'll still be here. <laughs> I never looked at him. Now, I'm sorry I didn't. And you know, I haven't been able to see one since, uh, since I made him. Now, you, I, even today, I can't get one. Oh, they're around somewhere. Oh, that's they have around. to be. They ha sure, they're around. Mike, do you have prints of all the movies you made? I have several, and hoping to have all the ones I made in color from Snuffy. I bought one from him the other day, and I won't buy Roy's trailer Robin Hood if we're all in together. Oh, you see, you're lucky you made them for Republic. Yes, sir. And he has yeah. most of them from Republic, mm -hmm. you see. You know what I'd like to say this, Tom, uh, just in a quick second. Just sitting here with you guys is, is really something for me. I really mean this. I mean, here's two great men, three great men. I'm just... I didn't uh -huh. hit the long ball in this business. I'm not a ball baloney. You may not hit like the long ball, but you're not a guy out here with gold pieces on. <laughs> but I'm, I'd like to say that. Well, my you wife Joanne. On gold pieces. <laughs> my wife Joanne is sitting back there, and she let me wear these so it looked nice on your show. They're her. Well, thank her but very like, much. Thank you, Tom. I'd like to say this. I really mean this. My heart it says life is like a journey taken on a train with a pair of travelers at each window pane. I may sit beside you gentlemen the whole journey through, or I may sit elsewhere never knowing you. But if fate should mark us all to sit there side by side, let's be pleasant travelers because it's such a short old ride. Mm. Amen. Oh, Amen. Nice. Oh, yes. nice. Okay. Listen, you mentioned Snuff, and we are going to show him to the entire television audience after these words from our sponsors. We'll be right back after these commercials. Beautiful. Too. I thought he'd <laughs> <laughs> That was well there. Uh, Snuff Garrett is neither a cowboy star nor Superman, but he is a super record producer with clients like Cher and Liza Minnelli, and he has also had the idea of bringing back the work of our matinee heroes here tonight, wonderful old movies, serials, and other memorabilia from the 30s and 40s, and he markets all of these through his company, the Nostalgia Merchant. Here is Snuff Garrett. Now tell the story about Wisconsin. No, yeah, it's not that thrilling. Uh, you and I would enjoy it. Well, I don't think would enjoy it. When well, I, was... I mowed the lawn and you did the news at WRIT. I'm going to walk in. <laughs> I used to tell you, you didn't know me. That's you know? right. That's right. I lived with Gene Edwards and, uh, and his wife. Uh, I was 15 years old and I worked for McClendon Stations and they sent me up there to mow the, that damn big old lawn out there. Remember that big old lawn one? I sure did. You didn't know it until you got on that little paramour and run up and down it. <laughs> and I, and I, I did that and... Uh, you got the, the gig there because a guy uh, uh, had a got fired. Bill Weaver, a good friend, uh, both of our he used to be the manager Weaver. at WRIT. Uh, and, he knew, and he knew how big the lawn <laughs> was. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I got there. 
<laughs> the day I got there, I came, they flew me up because they had trade outs with Northwest, uh, or what was that airline? That Capital. Demo airline that they had. Yeah. yeah. No, not Capital. That was, that was, that was right. a demo airline. Right. Right. Total Let demo airline. But anyway, they put me on that and got me to New York, and then I run out of money up in New York, and Julie LaRosa, who used to come to Dallas, Julie bought me an airplane ticket over to Milwaukee, and then I got there. The first day I got there, Bill Weaver fired the newsman, and he had a guard dog. Rit. Big white German Shepherd. <laughs> well, all right, whatever you want to call him. So uh, he was, uh, he, I was sitting in a room with him, and Bill said, come in here, uh, George, or whatever the guy's name was. And he, and he had his dog with him on the leash and everything, and he, the dog sat down, and he said, uh, uh, you were fired. This your last day, and uh, you was late, and all that, or whatever the trip was. And the guy just unleashed a dog and said, kill. And that damn dog went over the desk after <laughs> Bill Weaver. And, and then, what was even worse, the guy worked on Weaver with the chain while the dog was working. I, and Bill said, go get the hat. <laughs> well, there goes the hat. Yeah, get that hat. Yeah, well, I'm learning it. So, anyway, he went, he went and got, uh, I ran and got Gene. He was on the air. It was in the afternoon. Gene Edwards. Uh, Eugene Gugick. Is this Eugene real? Gugick. But he got me started later. in the music business, uh, 15 years old, and then I, then I, when I, when, uh, He got me fired from the radio station. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> worked out better than me than it did for you, doesn't it, old dog? I don't know, it's worked out pretty well for me. I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, um, uh, Anyway, anyway yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's all. see, I told you when I, I told that's, you. That's you. boring. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get into this thing now with the nostalgia company? I mean, here they you are with a big uh, It's always been my hobby. You know, is somebody calling you? <laughs> <laughs> in here, yeah. Uh, it's always been my hobby, and uh, I've been in the music But, business. I mean, you're very rich. If you handle Cher and these other clients that I've mentioned here uh, uh, tonight, you're a very rich man. Why would you have to do this? No, I don't. Because you are very rich, aren't you? <laughs> you're the worst. No, the no, come on, I'm, I'm getting the I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm but, sticking to you. I, I, but I, anyway, uh, I... Uh, it's always uh, I grew up to these pictures, and uh, it was a it was a uh, very important thing in my life. And uh, so after I came to LA, slept in the car, dressed <laughs> in gas stations, and started making records. And I've uh, been eating regular a long time, 20 years, making all them records, over 30 or 35 top tens. Mm -hmm. So then I uh, when I'd go home at night, you didn't have to be a brain surgeon to watch these pictures. You know, a rocket ship scientist. So I'd sit and watch those. It took my mind off everything else. I grew up to him, Monty. I'm from Dallas, and the Crest Theater uh, was owned by Phil Isley. It's one of the Isley Theaters, which was uh, Jennifer Jones' dad. Well, well, this, was, was, uh, this yes. goes back to right. the bond. Well, well, when I was a little kid, I went to see Monty on stage there, and uh, he did his stage act, and all of us kids would run, and, and I got his autograph. And they shut the door, went into the manager's office in his little local theater, and shut the door, and it was all in there with Monty. And I thought, how important do you have to be to get in that room? And... Uh, so that, it, it, it's, it's still fun to sit here and stare at him and be with Roy. How did you get all the pictures, though? I mean, where did you find all the stuff that you have? Because a lot of it, I'm sure, was scattered, scattered hither well, and Well, it still is. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the people at NTA were very kind, and uh, I said, hey, uh, let's give people the right to own these pictures in their own home, to watch them, 16 millimeter, Super 8, Vitamac, video cassette, or if you're wealthy enough, We'll get as many of the original players together and come out and shoot <laughs> the damn thing again and you move there. Yeah, yeah. 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 You can roll your own, Cowboy. Yeah. You know? So, <laughs> so uh, like, like Double R, uh, uh, I got to know Roy, and uh, he was, as I say, a, a great inspiration in my life. When I, when I got here, Tom, I lived in a boarding house right behind Groma's Chinese Theater called Mo, Ma Brown. And I got there, and, and it was a thing where uh, four guys lived in a room, and you had one of them uh, cots, one of them army cots, mm -hmm. and you put your stuff underneath it. And uh, I went out to, to go to the Gromas Chinese Theater and saw a movie that night and looked at all the footprints out there. And I come back and somebody stole all my stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was funny as hell now, but it sure wasn't funny no, that night. Not funny then. So I sat on the edge of the cot there and said, what's the deal, you know? But it sounds silly today for a 39-year-old man to say, uh, all the times that I thought about these pictures and everything, that was the inspiration to me. And I said, hey, to hell with it, I'll go right on rock and roll and get, get after them. And I did. And you did. Yes, And I the did. rest is history. Well, to me it is. To you, it don't mean that. No, it does. <laughs> it didn't mean a damn to me. No, this would be <laughs> Say, listen, I promised I'd tell you, you've got to tell quickly why you wear the black hat. Well. And I mean quickly. Well, I said it because we were all wearing white hats, and I wanted to be a little different. So I started that black outfit, and uh, I thought, well, the light-colored hat doesn't go with these dark clothes, 
So let's change it and put on black. And I found that it was very impressive. Uh, coming in as, the, as uh, some gal told me one time, she said, you know, I was watching one of your pictures with my kids the other night, and you are the master of the offstage entrance. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> they got to be a gimmick. The heavies come in, they're trying to do something for somebody, and you hear this voice come over. I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> the pan over, and there I am with that deadly stare, as you say, in the doorway. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back after these words from our affiliated stations. <laughs> Again, thanks to Tim Holt and to Marty Hale and to Snuff Garrett and to Kurt Allen and to Roy Rogers and to all of you sweet dreams from Los Angeles. And good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.